Hey, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of The Trend Report. I'm glad you're here today for what I know is going to be a great conversation. And I'm really excited to welcome the first official full-time product designer to the episode. Um, I'd like to welcome Brian Graham with Graham Designs. How are you, Brian? Great, Sid. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. And so I kind of um, opened the bag that you are a product designer. So why don't you tell everybody kind of who you are and what you do? Well, I am an interior designer, Sid, that had morphed into a furniture and product designer. I graduated from Cal State Long Beach uh, back in the 80s, so I had uh, a little more hair and I had shoulder pads. (laughs) And then (laughs) I swore it looked good at the time. I love it. Yeah. So I I, uh, evolved. I went to work at Gensler, first in Los Angeles, and then moved up to their headquarters in San Francisco. And as I kind of progressed as an interior designer, I got more and more involved in designing millwork, one-off pieces, and started to really get sort of into this idea of doing objects and systems that were maybe ultimately going to become products and uh, just sort of bit by the bug. Wow. So how long did you practice as an interior designer? Well, um, I still kind of consider myself an interior designer and okay. I love the, the term practice, right? Because it means that we're never getting it quite right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not what I meant, but anyways. No, it's true, it. right? Yeah, I appreciate it. It's a practice. Yeah. Um, so I, I would practice from 84 to 99. Okay. Uh, when I left Gensler in 1992, uh, I struck out with another buddy of mine who actually was my best man at my wedding, John mm-hmm. Thiel. And we had a partnership, Thiel and Graham, for about six years. And we did a combination of architecture, interiors, and product design. Okay, awesome. So you got yeah. bit by the bug by designing custom millwork. And then one thing led to the other. And then you just kept, you just kept going, which is pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. And what I really didn't realize at the time, you know, when you're inside of a great firm like Gensler, you're sort of, uh, you know, think a certain way of certain things being done a certain way. And then when you start to transition from a one off piece to a production piece or mass manufacturing, it's a completely different mentality. And I love the learning about all of that because that was not something that was part of my training. Mm -hmm. But I, as you enjoy to constantly learn new things. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's uh, an interesting perspective that you bring up about realizing that one-off is one thing, but designing something for mass production is another thing. And for somebody that's been in the furniture business, you know, pretty much my entire career, um, I know specials, if you will, or customs are part of the part of the game, but I used to always hate them because (laughs) it was typically like one or two pieces that somebody wanted like six inches longer or the legs to be different. And, and working for a factory that was in mass production, people don't fully understand how that complicates the manufacturing process and mm-hmm. why it makes it a four weekly time an eight weekly time and all the processes that have to go into place. And so I, I think it's, a, I appreciate you acknowledging that it was a completely different perspective and you had to learn differently from mill work to, you know, mass, mass production. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that uh, continues on to this day. Uh, Oftentimes, when I get involved in developing a product, part of the brief will be it needs to be adaptable. Mm. And that's because we know that uh, nothing is actually quite perfect, right? Things need to be uh, six inches longer, three inches deeper, what have you. Mm -hmm. And some things that could be really challenging and some products don't really lend themselves to that. But if you design it intelligently, I do think that you can uh, sort of embrace that level of tailoring, if you will, of certain pieces. But you've you've got to think about that from the get-go. Yeah, so many, many years ago, and I'm gonna contradict what I just said, right? (laughs) But that's okay. But many years ago, when I was working at a, one of the top four brands, um, I led a pursuit that we ended up winning that was like 10,000 workstations. Mm. And, you know, that's kind of what I did back in the day. And um, they asked us for a special. And I just like, that's not going to happen. And it was, I'm not going to describe it because it'll be too boring to describe the special. But um, I went specials and they said no. And then I went back to the client and they said, you got to do it. We don't like this. And I just kept pushing specials and pushing specials. So finally 
the guy's name was Kevin. He figured out how to the special engineer because I was like, had his cell phone number. I'm like, dude, you got to do this. <laughs> and so he finally figured it out. And they told us at the end that that was one of the reasons that we won the project because we figured out how to solve the problem by product modification. So as painful as specials can be, they're also, <clears throat> excuse me, they're also really important. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I love how you framed it as adaptability, right? As you're designing right. and you're putting in your product brief adaptability, which kind of leads me, Brian, to my question. Tell us about the product design process that you go through when designing products. Wow. Well, um, for me, it all starts with a sketch. Um, I, I should preface this by saying if I've established a good relationship with my manufacturing partners. Uh, it could be somebody that I've worked with in the past or it could be somebody I've never worked with. To me, the foundation I build is first a really fundamental understanding of who they are, where they wanna be, um, how they like to come to market. It's much more sort of strategic for me than just starting out with, hey, let's design a chair. In fact, <laughs> I've been accused sometimes of talking people out of uh, mm -hmm. asking me to do something because I've said, well, wait a minute now, is why do you want a chair? Or why do you want a sectional? Or, or why are we doing that? And you just sort of dig a little bit deeper and you get a bit of more sort of a fundamental understanding of what their business is. And, and it may be, yeah, then a sectional or a chair or a sofa or something is exactly right. But more often than not, we'll find another opportunity or we'll expand on that opportunity to give them something that's really going to be meaningful to their business. Okay. So step number one in, in the product design process, know the customer. Yeah. Know the customer, know what they need, which honestly is not a lot of different when you're on the other side of the fence and actually selling the product. You need to know the customer. You need to know what their needs are. You know what their wants are. So yeah. once you get to know the customer and understand their needs, do you, I mean, do you just start like sketching on a napkin? I mean, tell me how you do that process. I'm fascinated. Yeah, some, yeah sometimes I do sketch on a napkin. Uh, you know, when I used to travel, remember that we were on planes, Yep. Um, which used to be great time for me to draw because it was sort of, you know, five hours uninterrupted and I would sit with my sketchbook, which I have right here. Awesome. And, uh, that That's kind of how it starts. I just sort of start to record ideas. But oftentimes when I'm starting, what I'll do is I'll go back to the pile of sketchbooks that I have from probably the last five years. And I'll go through those and I'll just see, was there anything that I was just noodling or thinking about unrelated to what I'm currently working on, but that's related to what I'm thinking about or sure. working on. And so from there, the sketches then quickly get into a computer and because I want to give them uh, scale, I want to give them sure. uh, proportion, but then almost immediately I'm printing those back out and I'm drawing on top of those because for me, I'm not as facile with the computer as I am with my hand. Mm -hmm. And I want to imbue the computer sort of hard edges with the gesture of my hand because I feel like that's really important. Okay. So Brian, where does your inspiration come from? I mean, how do you find inspiration when going to design a product? Wow. Um, I would say first and foremost, it's just an observational nature that I think most designers have, right? Yes. We're so visual that everything is a choice. Everything is something to be scrutinized, to be evaluated, to absorb. And so as broad as that sounds, I would say consistently architecture continues to be my sort of muse. I'm constantly looking at architecture, both, uh, from the classic modernism sense of, uh, of it, which is hugely inspirational to me, mm -hmm. uh, all the way to the most modern things that are being done today. And uh, so that, that's why I'm constantly running into stuff as I'm walking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> I told this story on another podcast, I think. But, you know, when you, when you fall in love with the furniture business, Mm. And you really love products. When you mm -hmm. see something that you really like out in a public space, what do you do? You turn it over. That's right. You turn, stop and turn it upside down and you look <laughs> at it. You want to know who made it, right? Because you're like, well, that's really pretty. I wonder who made that. And the only way to find out is to turn that sucker over. <laughs> and so I never will forget. I was walking through a hospital lobby with my mother. This was, I don't know how many years ago. 
And um, I don't even remember who we were visiting, but we were visiting somebody that was in the hospital and we were walking through the hospital lobby and I saw this really cool chair and I went, oh, that's really pretty. And I stopped and turned it over. She was totally embarrassed by the fact that I turned it over. I'm like, well, how else am I supposed to know what it is and who to sell, who I could sell, right? Uh, Or what brand it was. So I love that perspective. Yeah, you get a lot of really weird looks at restaurants. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I think it's interesting that you find inspiration from architecture. I know as a, as a, I don't consider myself a creative, but I know that creatives all find inspiration from a variety of places. But for me, though, I, again, I'm not, I don't consider myself a creative, but as a journalist, which I don't even consider myself a journalist, but as someone who produces content, both written and audio and video content, especially the written content, a lot of my inspiration comes from listening to people mm. and reading things that maybe inspire me or even trigger me mm-hmm. um, in one way or the other. And it, it, it inspires me to share my thoughts, either mm-hmm. pro or con to whatever that subject matter is. So I'm always interested where people find inspiration. And, you know, for me, it's usually like early in the morning, like I wake up with an idea about something mm-hmm. that I read or something that I heard the day before, and I got to get up and I got to start putting it out on a piece of paper, right? Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I relate to that in that um, I have often, and maybe you have too, I've, I've woken up at three in the morning and sort of had to draw something. I had to mm-hmm. get something down because I knew that I might lose it mm-hmm. and I didn't want to. And it was weird because you know, then you wake up in the morning, you go and you think, <laughs> I don't know what that was, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk for a minute about um, who you've designed for. So can you mention mm-hmm. some of the brands and some of the products that you've actually designed that are in your portfolio, if you will? Mm-hmm. Well, sure. Uh, uh, I think most people probably, and the pr- people that got me my start was Martin Bradshrew. Okay. I think a lot of people know me from having an over 30 year association with Martin Bradshrew. Wow. Uh, they're the guys that kind of gave me uh, my first opportunity to design something and put my name on it. And this was when I was still at Gensler and I was just sort of figuring stuff out. Yep. And uh, so I kind of credit them for really establishing me as uh, as a furniture designer. Uh, but from there, uh, and, I'm, and I'm very proud to continue that relationship to this day. We're producing lots of new things, and and uh, that's really, I mean, a testament I think to to both of us is to be able to work together for that long and still mm-hmm. produce things that are relevant. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, um, and then uh, certainly my work with uh, Deca Contract. Uh, that's based in Minneapolis. John Fishbach is their president. I've worked with them for about 15 years. Uh, and, and for both of those companies, not only do I author product, but I also am an advisor. Mm-hmm. And um, they have me on a retainer. And so uh, basically it's an on-call design conscience. It's, hey, we're thinking about doing this. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's been really nice. That's great. So yeah. you're designing products, but you're also consulting as they look to continue to expand their brands. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's updating older products or bringing in other designers. They're reaching out to you to say, is this consistent with what our brand is? Will it, where does mm-hmm. this fit within our portfolio? I think that's great. I love that. So who else? Th- thanks. Uh, well, um, uh, Noel, certainly, I think is probably one of the high points of my career, for sure, my association with them, which went uh, actively for about nine or 10 years. So I got started with them in 2005. We introduced the first product in 2007, an additional product in 2010. And that uh, was continuing on for quite some time. And there's quite a lot of work there. And I really enjoyed working with them because obviously it's Noel. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain reverence. I mean, if you were going to pick out of school, it's like, who would you like to have product with? You know, it's Miller, Noel, right? I mean, those are the kinds of Vitra, those B&B. So it was a great experience. I I find that all of these manufacturers, they're so interesting to me. They're different scale, they're different size. They have a different sort of approach to things. But fundamentally, what they do is they believe that working with somebody like me, is going to give them um, an advantage and to help them build their business. I, I have no illusions about being an, an artist, Sid. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a commercial furniture designer uh, because the nature of commercial furniture design is so uh, good or bad or indifferent about matching up with needs that have been identified in the market, right? They did this, we need our version of that. 
And so for me, the people I've worked with, uh, they're, they respond to the market needs, but they still want to employ a designer because the designer is going to take it to another level. Yeah. Does that make um, sense? Oh, absolutely. It does. <clears throat> because I've been in those situations where I've seen um, how the company responds to what the market is requesting. Mm -hmm. And then they take it to a designer and the designer actually does what you do to it. And all of a sudden it looks a lot different. So mm -hmm. I, I completely understand what you're saying there, but Brian, you've been doing this for a long time. Right. And this is always something that's kind of been a question for me that I, and I hear a lot of people ask this question as well. Why does the product design process take so long? Ah, because well, my answer is, it go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say, you know what? I mean, somebody introduced, I heard this story the other day. I don't remember who it was. Somebody was introducing something new mm -hmm. that had been two to three years in development. Yeah. And it just so happens that the design of the product happens to accommodate a post COVID workplace, but that's not by design because three years ago, they didn't know that. But mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about it, when you hear that term three years, it took three years to design this product. So um, continue about why it takes so long. Well, I, I will be the one to say, I don't think that the process of designing the product takes three years. Okay. I would say that the commercialization of the product takes three years. Design is a part of that and certainly starts it, but because you're so uh, involved with uh, vendors, purchasing, uh, all of those things, engineering, testing, uh, market support, right? I mean, I think about the databases that they had built for companies like Knoll and products that I've done for other manufacturers that are 500, 600, 700 SKUs. I mean, that's two people full time for six months Wow! to, to get all that together. Here's another example. Uh, a lot of people don't know. When we want to have a piece of glass offered as an option, the enlightened manufacturers need three different vendors to be able to do that glass. Because if somebody comes in and says, I need 500 sets of that, the first vendor may only be able to do 200 in the six week lead time. So they need to be able to go to these other vendors to, to pull it together and, and do it. So a lot of it is, is working through all of that preparation before you actually can launch a product. So I appreciate everything that you just said, because I, uh, me and others are lumping mm. the design process in why does it take so long to design a product? But that, also includes the sourcing, the engineering work, because once you design it and once everybody kind of agrees on the design, then typically, um, and correct me if I say this wrong, okay, but then the factory's got to go engineer it or hire a third party engineer to engineer it to make sure that it actually can indeed be manufactured. And then you've got to go and that they can manufacture it. And if they can't, what materials or equipment do they need to actually do the manufacturing? And then you got to source it. And to your point, they need multiple revenue stream, not revenue stream, they need multiple supply chain streams for that material as we well experienced in COVID, mm -hmm. the lack of raw materials and supply chain impact to do things created demand, high demand and for certain different types of products. So the factories have to prepare and get ready, then negotiate those contracts. And then there's the whole BIFMA testing component of it. Does it meet? If it doesn't, what has to change in order for it to meet? So I really appreciate you sharing that. And, you know, hopefully my reframe to our community um, makes it easy, even easier to understand. But the reality is it's not something you can do in two weeks. It's going to take time because of all of this complexity. That's absolutely right. And it also explains, I think, why the hesitancy back to our earlier part of our discussion about customs, because then you're saying, well, all these parts are tooled. Now you're telling me that I've got to do this or do that. It's not as easy as it seems. Sure. Can I can I reframe your reframe? Yes, this? please do. Go <laughs> ahead, coach. Take it away. I would just say that um, true, the design and the presentation and their acceptance of it is the beginning. The designer then is always involved it's not a matter of throwing it over the wall and then engineering figures it out and said hey it doesn't work mm -hmm. my experience is the engineers the best experiences the best engineers the best manufacturing people they're involved from the get-go 
Okay. And we are running down. It's like a game of rugby. We're running with the ball and we're passing it off to each other synchronously as we're running down the field. Excellent. Right. Yes. That way we can actually cut down the back and forth. But that means that the designer has to be really agile, have the respect of the engineers and conversely respect the engineers. Sure. And you it's a team sport. Yeah, I love that reframe. So continue along that path of reframing me <laughs> because I think it's great because I, I like the I, I like the rugby analogy that you're running yeah. along together, passing the ball to each other. And you got to be able to collaborate with each other um, in order to get the product to the finish line because at the end of the day, that's what everybody wants to get the product to the finish line so that it can bring it to market. Exactly. And actually, I, I have to credit one of my other uh, beloved manufacturers who's kind of no longer in existence, Metro, mm -hmm. who's based in here in San Francisco. When I was transitioning out of Gensler, I had been working on a product that was acknowledging, this is in the early 90s, acknowledging the changing nature of meetings and conferences. And the operating, uh, the, the sort of our operating name was rugby. That was what we wanted to call the product because it was all of us doing this together at the same time. It ended up becoming teamwork, which was kind of a seminal product for the market because it was the first one that really sort of acknowledged agility and different needs happening in conference and, multi and uh, meeting spaces. Metro obviously was part of the Steelcase Design Partnership. I think now it's part of coalesce and oh, okay. i actually do think there is one remaining piece the satellite table that remains from that 25 year old product okay so i have a couple of questions around i'm not gonna i want to but i'm not going to <laughs> ask you your favorite product that you designed but i won't do um, that i won't put you on the spot like that but uh, what is your favorite product that another designer has designed like is there oh. like a product that stands out that you're like wow that's absolutely beautiful that like really stands out yeah gosh and i can't really even just say one can i say uh, i'll say that almost anything that antonio Chaterio designs okay. i just think uh you know like right. it's so logical it's so practical and yet it's so poetic sure uh so I think anything he designs, I think Pierce and Lloyd are amazing. Uh, I think Jasper Morrison's clarity of product is phenomenal. So everything I see from Barbara Os uh, Augersby is incredible. I mean, that's the thing. And, and if you have other furniture designers who you know, you kind of realize that A, we pretty much know each other and B, we're fanboys, we're fangirls <laughs> of each other. Sure. And it's really fun because they're just some amazingly talented people. And what it does is inspires you to say, man, I, I wish I had done that product. Mm -hmm. And I, like, I want to go and do that with somebody else. Sure. That's awesome. So yeah. thank you for sharing all those wonderful designer names. Uh, we will do our best to link like to their websites in the show notes oh, along with yours. Cool. So, uh, but I appreciate that because I think it's fascinating um, to learn about this and to learn. I mean, admittedly, Brian, you and I met on Clubhouse. I don't know yes. that I would have ever met you otherwise, which I think is another whole conversation by itself. But none of the people that you mentioned do I know, which is okay because I'm not on that side of the fence, nor have I ever been. Mm -hmm. So I'm always, as you mentioned early on, I'm an avid learner. And so I always want to learn and I always want, like to see what people are doing. So we'll drop those links if we can find them into the show notes. So anybody else that's as uh, interested as I am can go check it out. So kind of on that line about favorite products, what's your favorite type of product to design? Mm. You mentioned seating, case goods, tables, and other things. Do you have a favorite that you really like to design? Yeah, I think that probably uh, tables for me are probably the most natural thing for me to do because they're fairly uh, pragmatic, linear, planar, um, and, and I've designed quite a few of them, and, and I feel like I could always bring, <laughs> forgive me for this bad pun, something new to the table. But... Um, what I've been recently really doing is uh, a lot of upholstered goods. 
And that's so much more like functional sculpture to me, especially when you're talking about upholstering, because you're trying to take pieces of paper and sort because pieces of paper are essentially like the fabric yep. and mold it and shape it. It's not unlike dressmaking or making a shirt and thinking about seaming and everything and, and how can you get comfort and how can you convey a certain feel that is so hands-on and it's the one thing that I think has been sorely difficult to do these past year because typically that's something that you would do in person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned textiles and things of that nature that, and you're doing a lot of upholstery work right now. Mm -hmm. Is there a favorite material that you like to work with? Well, I would say I love to work with aluminum because oh. now wait a I minute like for our European friends, you're supposed to say aluminum. <laughs> I was just about to say because I get to say aluminum. Oh, okay, there you have it. You know, like one of my favorite designers is Johnny Ive, and I love when he used to, you know, do the video presentations for a new Mac because it it was in durable aluminum, <laughs> and it was like. I got to buy that. <laughs> I love it. That's great. But I, I've done so much work uh, with manufacturers over the years in extrusions and mm -hmm. castings. And, you know, understand from an interior design perspective, you, I, I had no grounding in any of that. You know, my friends right. in the ID class, they knew all that stuff. Uh, I learned about other things. So for me to learn about manufacturing methodologies, how extrusions work, how to design with them. From a very early, when I was first working with Halcon, which was probably the second product line that was um, debuted for me at Neocon back in the early 90s, we did a bunch of extrusions. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge learning curve for me and they were super supportive. And since then I've probably done, I don't know, seven or eight different collections for a bunch of different manufacturers, for Geiger, for OFS, all uh, with extrusions as some level of it. So I guess you'd say that's probably my my favorite material to work with. Okay. And so for a point of reference, you just mentioned an acronym and I want to clarify ID stands mm. for, and I'm going to, I'm going to say what I think, correct me if I, if I say it wrong. Okay. Ready? Industrial yeah. design. Bingo. Okay. Got it right, guys. There you go. Good guess. I thought that's what it meant, ID, because the way you were describing it, I went, he's talking about industrial design. But I just want to clarify for the listeners in case they only heard ID, what it means is industrial design. That's, that's right. That's right. And and a lot of people say, well, so Brian, you know, you do furniture design. Why didn't you study industrial design in school? And my answer is because there were more good looking women in interior design than industrial design. And of course, I never dated any of them. That was not the thing, right? We worked together like we do today, right? But, you know, I'm I'm 20 years old. What am I thinking? Yeah, just notice the motivation, guys, to enter the interior design <laughs> world, not industrial design. And look at where he is now combining interior design and industrial design together. And, uh, Brian, you mentioned a few minutes ago, you and your wife have been married how long? 28 years. And she works with you, right? She does. Yeah, that's awesome. She puts up with you. Uh, she does. And she's a designer by training. She went okay. to San Diego State. She uh, then got into uh, sales and management. She worked for Sunder Hauserman, Stendig, two tours of Dirty with Noel, Kimball, Geiger. And so she's my secret weapon, Sid. Mm -hmm. She's the one who's whispering in my ear, you know, about, well, have you thought about how that impacts the dealer? Or have you thought about how that might be for installation or, or any of those things? Wow, those are really good questions. I'm glad she's, as a former manufacturer and dealer, and someone who's lived through installation nightmares, I'm glad that she's asking <laughs> you those questions, right? Well, right, I mean, what's the old adage, right? You go to an installation site and you see all these parts all over the place and they're like, oh God, what do we do? Like I've designed something that the feedback came back and they go, Brian, it's beautiful, it's incredible, but we needed four guys to lift it up onto the French cleat. And I said, geez, um, I don't really know what to do because they don't want to break it up into two pieces. And, it, you know, it's just unintended consequences. Sure, absolutely. But I mean, I, I love the explanation of this process and kind of what all you go through. So, Brian, when you're thinking about products as you're designing them, what are some of the problems that you're trying to address mm. that exist today? Wow. Well, a lot of those problems sit, in my opinion, are the same problems we've been dealing with for the last 20 years. Uh, adjacency, agency, uh, c conflicting uses happening in the same space. 
territory. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, what I've been working on has to do with those issues. Um, it may end up starting out as a seeding system, but pretty quickly you're realizing I need connectivity. I have adjacency to other types of uh, spaces. Do I need some level of territory or you know, division, what have you? So that's what I think you're seeing, and I've been working on quite a bit, are more sort of modular, systematized kinds of approaches without necessarily conveying a system approach. You know, something that's really soft and nice that you can sit in, but you could also have a screen, I can connect, I can tap in, um, I can have other people around me, or I could be by myself. So the flexibility and agility of the furniture, which by the way, makes it more expensive and harder to do. But ultimately, I think that's what we're seeing and working on a lot. Well, if COVID taught us anything as it relates to furniture and space is the agility that you just mentioned and that mm -hmm. spaces need to be adaptable. I've watched a lot of webinars. I've listened to a lot of people speak about all this and it's very consistent across all verticals that people are talking about adaptability of space and product. Mm -hmm. So I love kind of like that thought process. Have you had to like in the, be in the middle of a design of a product and based on what's happened in the world, have you had to go back and say, okay, this is not going to work now based on the way the new workplace is going to look moving forward? Um, I don't say, I don't know that I've, I've done it just like that. I think mm -hmm. what we have, and this is sort of pre-pandemic, I have gotten through something where I felt like we had a pretty good statement of line or SOL is what we usually refer to yep. it, which I know also stands for other things, but this is a family show. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's great, Brad. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you get to a certain point, you think you've got everybody with stacked hands, we're ready to go. And it's like, you know what, but it's not addressing this other need that we're starting to see from the dealers or from the floor plans. I have to tell you, I think that's fine. I always start with an interior designer's mentality. I want to see floor plans. I want to see how people are using furniture. In fact, one of my things that I'm constantly doing is keeping in touch with a, a network of people, dealers, uh, sales reps, designers, and querying them on, hey, what are you seeing? What are the problems you have to work with? How do you see these things? And what's not really being addressed? And they're a constant source of, I guess you'll call it practical inspiration for me. Sure. So I really appreciate the fact that you never stop asking questions. Hmm. You never stop learning. You never start asking questions. You're tapping our community in a variety of different places to see what they're doing to, un excuse me, to understand what's working, what's not working and what's missing in order to discover the next Brian Graham original, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> That's right. Yes. I mean, I, one day I'll be fortunate enough to have a Brian Graham original in my house. That <laughs> might've been a hint. I don't know. Maybe that's it. <laughs> so with call me, we can talk about a discount <laughs> like they'd listen to me. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Have you ever thought about or have you ever designed a residential product? I mean, that certainly is on the rise in a big way right now. Not intentionally. Mm, okay. But I think what we're finding is that uh, a lot of that crossover product types are happening. I mean, I've long believed that with few exceptions, a chair is a chair is a chair. And for us to think, well, that's only going to be in hospitality or that's only going to be in commercial was sort of these discrete vertical markets that I think are almost completely obliterated now. So like I'm working right now on doing uh, some healthcare uh, concepts and the desire is for it to not look like healthcare furniture, which apparently as I'm learning is a, is a thing. And so I think one of the reasons I'm coming to it is because they want an outsider's perspective because they already know what, what a healthcare furniture solution looks like. Mm -hmm. How far can I push it? Now I'm getting, I'm going to get pushback, and maybe it'll start to, you know, look a little bit more like healthcare furniture. But my sense is that contract designers are starting to work in healthcare spaces. Healthcare designers are starting to work in hospitality spaces, and so all of that melange, if you will, means we just need really intelligently, beautifully functional product. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of blurring of the lines, if you will. Yes. 
between yes. the different verticals. Because now, I mean, I appreciate the fact that a healthcare manufacturer came to you and said, I want a product that doesn't look healthcare because there is a distinct look to healthcare. There's mm -hmm. also a distinct look to hospitality and to mm -hmm. residential. And as we see some of the leading brands in our industry start to focus on the residential market and what they can do to the residential market, then um or what they can do for it it's going to be interesting to see how those lines even get more blurred right mm -hmm. absolutely and, um <clears throat> it is interesting that so many people are going to in our industry are headed to residential which could be a whole nother podcast by itself but they're all headed that way for a mm -hmm. lot of different reasons but i happen to be um on a clubhouse a couple of weeks ago and i was just popping around and i saw something about interior design and furniture so I popped into it and now it's actually it was the editors from the business of home magazine, which I didn't know that existed, but that's okay. Um, and there were five of them up there and they were talking, they had a couple people on this stage. And one of the guys said, I don't even know who he was with. He was a manufacturer. And he's like, well, our lead time's 20 weeks. I literally about fell out of my chair. I'm like, I couldn't imagine telling an office furniture customer that the lead time on something was 20 weeks. Now that is directly related to supply chain as mm -hmm. I heard, as I listened, but my point being is there is an opportunity, I believe it for manufacturers in our industry to enter the residential market with quality product at an affordable price that can be delivered in timeframes that we're used to, not necessarily what people in the residential market are used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think this blurring of these things is interesting because now, you know, maybe you want a little bit more performance and functionality at home and a little more durability at home, but you also want sort of the softness that you, you know, the office wants the softness and the sort of the, the homefulness, not my term, somebody else's term, yep. that uh, we were starting to imbue into the offices. So really interesting times right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, Brian. What kind of advice would you give to an inspiring interior designer slash inspiring product designer that would help them, you know, move their career forward and, and you know, hopefully one day get to the same place that you are? Somebody that's got a mm. long list of beautiful products that they've designed in a successful business. Well, thank you. Um, I, I would say that my advice would be that um, first seek to understand the market that you're trying to get into. Uh, really be a sponge to absorb how things work, why things are done the way they're done. It's a real education. And then as you approach a manufacturer, don't necessarily try to pitch one thing. Pitch yourself as an author of many things, of limitless things. I find that uh, too often, I think we're too object oriented, we're too, um, concerned about the result rather than building a relationship that will maybe yield many, many results. So what you just said, I want to repeat, pitch yourself and don't focus just on one thing, but focus on many things because it starts with you, right? It starts with you as mm. the designer. It starts with you as the salesperson. It starts with you as the um, designer at the dealership or I mean it starts with you and pitch yourself and let that lead to other things I we see it happen every day and and I love salespeople I was one of them for a really long time but they walk into the door of a customer and before they ask the first question they know exactly what chair they're selling they know exactly yeah, no, what I, product that they're selling I without totally ever that. asking a question Right. And yeah, yeah. And not to take this off on a tangent, but I have to say when we've been on clubhouses together and I and I, you're you're very good at, at eliciting input and, and and conversation from people. And I've heard people talk about uh, sort of a solution selling. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, well, we got to sell solutions. I would posit the solution is furniture. I mean, if you're a furniture person, I mean, as we talked about before, we love architects. Right. We think. They're terrific. The buildings exist to put people in to work, <laughs> to to collaborate, to facilitate what they do. The furniture is the equipment and the tools that enable that and activate that space. Mm -hmm. And we're finding even more so now that the solutions are furniture based because people don't want to necessarily invest in 
walls or in other fixed items. They need flexibility, they need agility. Mm -hmm. That means it's gonna be furniture. And so we're more challenged than ever now as furniture salespeople, as furniture marketing people, as furniture designers with understanding the applications of the furniture and what the demand is and making sure that we respond with agile, flexible, usable solutions. To, to me, solution selling is understanding that at the end, you're probably going to get to a furniture solution. It may not be necessarily that chair you're going into pitch. It may be something else. Right. So I love how you phrase that. And I think it's appropriate that you don't go in with just, I'm going to sell this product and this particular brand, but really go in and listen, listen to what the client needs because furniture really is the solution in so many ways. But if we go in preconceived that this I'm going to sell this X, Y, Z chair and this ABC desk, then you may miss the opportunity for other sales because you're so narrow minded on one particular thing. Mm. Yep. The furniture sellers, don't be mad at me because I called you narrow minded. That was not my intent. But you get my point, <laughs> right, Brian? <laughs> he said it in a loving and caring way, I think. <laughs> well, listen, it has been an absolute pleasure having you today in this conversation. You shared a lot of really, really good information. But for me... I think my biggest takeaway from this is understanding the design process, what you go through as a product designer and the partnerships that you really create with the brands that you work with. So I appreciate you being here, but I have one last question for you. Sure. Do you have any products that we're going to see this year at Neocon coming out? That is a great question. It's in October this year, right? Yes, it is in October. You still have a few months, Brian. Because <laughs> I got to tell you, right about now, I'm freaking out because it's like, it's six weeks away yeah. and we're not finished. But it's like, oh, good. It's only in October. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yes, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, with Martin Bratchwood, I'll have uh, three new products that you may have previewed or seen on Instagram, but you'll definitely see in the flesh. And then, uh, fingers crossed, there will be a new seating product for OFS. Okay, so excellent. So we're going to see you at Neocon in October then. Uh, to be determined. Okay, well, I hope I get to see you so that we can actually meet face to face. We've talked on Clubhouse before. Now we're Zooming. Yeah, yeah. Then, we're like, getting there. Yeah, we're getting there. It's like dating, Sid, you know, <laughs> like we've had coffee. That's right. And this is like lunch. L That's this right. is lunch is good. Now, are we going to go to dinner? I think so. Let's hope so. If we are, are you buy it? <laughs> Sure. Are you buy it. <laughs> you bet, <laughs> Brian. I do. I, I do hope I get to see you at Neocon, and I hope to get to see Me these too. new products they're introducing. And um, so, if our community would like to reach out to you and get it, and connect with you, what is the best way for them to do that? I would say you could go to LinkedIn. You could go to Instagram, which is Graham Design SF, as in San Francisco. Excellent. Or you can go to my website, which is three W's, then Graham Design SF dot com. Thank you for not, uh, thank you for saying three W's, by the way. I appreciate that. I, I'm going to start using that now. Uh, I love it. So we will drop all of that in the show notes for you guys so that you have the access to LinkedIn, um, the website, um, as well as the Instagram. And remember, if you do reach out to Brian on LinkedIn, be sure you drop him a note and let him know why you're connecting, that you heard him here on the trend report and that you wanted to reach out and connect with him that way. Again, Brian, thank you for being here. All the best, man. And I hope to get to see you in October. Me too, Sid. I really appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, bud.